just checking to make sure this is working. I'm going to do a presentation now um, showing the different types of ESL programs. Now, I'm also going to send you this chart, but I wanted to be able to talk about it and have it on my screen, which is something I wasn't able to do the other day. So let me go ahead and share. And here we go. And there it is. So um, right now, uh, as you can see on the screen, I have a comparison of different types of language programs. Some of you are very well acquainted with several of these and several of you, I can not assume, you may know nothing of these. So uh, you, you can correct me. I'm going to go ahead and make some statements about these. Uh, let me zoom in just a little bit more so it's easier to see. Um, so most early um, ESL programs that, that are created um, tend to have one of the first of these three on this page, light blue. Uh, there's the ESL pullout, the ESL push in, and the ESL class period. Uh, these types of programs exist because they're the easiest to schedule uh, on school administrators. And if you're a one half teacher or one full time teacher or whatever, whoever's, uh, I know uh, I remember watching one last night when the Spanish teacher is now the ESL teacher for one class period. And I, I'll have to look up my notes to remind myself who that is, but I'm actually going over all of your entries on the videos and they're excellent. And um, I take very copious notes over each person so that I can find out things that I can put up instantly to help you. That's why I'm doing, I'm not waiting till Sunday and give you a bunch of assignments. I'm gonna to continue to uh, send information to you to help you. I'm not going to take it, give you an exam over all this information. My goal is to provide you with as much as I can in the four weeks we have. It will go quickly. So ESL programs. This sheet is probably the primary sheet for most of you. ESL pullout. That literally is the student is pulled out of a class and sent to you for ESL instruction in a small group or even one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, this is uh, not a very good, there are disadvantages, advantages. Um, this is for usually for limited or no English proficiency. Sometimes it's used for any ESL type level. Uh, and the teacher that, it, that per, the student is sent to you and you're virtually t in charge of either teaching them English or teaching them the content of their content classes, which can be very unfortunate because then you become the algebra teacher, the math teacher, um, the social studies teacher, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the grades served, usually they do this in elementary, but it can happen anywhere. Um, the language goal theoretically is obviously, they'll say to make them fluent in English, but that's not gonna happen it's going to be to get them through so they can do their work or possibly do provide them with some speaking assistance. It's very, uh, very primitive, very primitive. This is not, in my opinion, a, a very good um, approach at all, but it's easy to schedule. So it's all work on the student and the ESL teacher. Um, and I also put teacher qualifications, but I have to tell you that, that that's really not, you know, it's great if you're qualified, but in some schools it could be the para or it could be whoever is willing to do it. Okay, I do have a thing in there about sheltered instruction, but I'm not going to go into that one. The second most common or one of the most common is push in. Now this is where the ESL teacher goes into the classroom with the students and provides support. This can work, but 
it's difficult for the ESL teacher because sometimes you become like a super para educator for the teacher you're in the room of. So for some people that is not pleasant, even if you're paid as a full-time teacher. You often find paras put in the same position. Uh, ELL teachers um, can, if, the, if you're knowledgeable about the area, you might be able to go in and help out if it's a history class and you know the alternatives to this are getting somebody in there who literally whispers to them in their native language or sets in the back with them. Um, this, uh, this can be successful, but it, it depends on the demeanor of the teacher that's sent into the room. And you really have to have good cooperation because this is not co-teaching. You are an assistant. Co-teaching something totally different. That would mean equal, there's some kind of equity there between the teachers and, and the design and delivery of the class. That's, that's something different. And most schools don't want to, the, the ESL person becomes the troubleshooter. They go in, they try to fix things. Okay, uh, next one is, uh, that's any grade. And uh, um, the teacher should be ESL certified, but that's what I would say in all these cases. All right, ESL class period. The difference there is that you actually have a scheduled one or two hours a day. The difference between this and a pullout is you don't want to pull out because pullout means that they've chosen a class that the student will not be a part of and they pull the kid out and they send them to the ESL teacher and, and the student misses that class. I've seen cases where the student missed a math class in fifth grade and when they got to sixth grade, uh, they, did, they had a year of, of mathematics missing and it caused them to be far behind. So they may, they may say, oh, well, I'm gonna pull you out of your gym class so you, don't, you never get physical education. This is not equitable. See, one of our issues as an ESL teacher is to advocate for equity and that students should not spend their recess period working on their English skills while everybody else plays. That's completely wrong and inappropriate. Okay, so the ESL class period should be scheduled. The students should have opportunities for everything else. And this could be even two hours or a whole afternoon. Uh, usually what people do is they try to schedule, um, there's several ways to go about this. Sometimes people schedule classes like art and music and singing and physical education activity or what people call less stress on the English. Um, but in fact, um, so they would go to ESL during that. Uh, ESL, uh, this way, at least it's predictable. You're not being pulled out and sent randomly. I can tell you that in the early days of Lexington, uh, when they very, very first did this, they, they actually had an ESL teacher or ESL teachers and people were literally tossed at them willy-nilly all day long. It was almost the point they couldn't eat lunch or go to the bathroom, but that, that was a long time ago. They don't do that anymore. But uh, I was told horror stories about that um, in the late 90s. Um, but but it's, the problem is, however you do this, you have to work into it and, and purpose of this class and my other classes is to give you ideas of what to propose to your to your administration to teach best. And so these are things that exist, but I don't recommend them particularly. Okay, um, of course the teacher should be an ESL teacher, especially in, well in all three of these, but particularly in uh, the ESL class period because you may have the whole class period all day long. You may have them all day long in like a newcomer program. Okay, let me go to the next one. And this is, uh, what do I wanna call this? This is the, uh, oh yeah, there's only two on this sheet. I thought I had three. Okay. Uh, sheltered instruction or content-based. This is a much more 
stable and professional program. You have an ESL content program that counts as credit, especially in middle school and high school. It counts um, as credit for the purposes of whatever's taught in there, whether it's math or whether it's science or English or whatever. So the students, this is very important. You want the English language learners, ELs, to literally be earning credits and studying the content simultaneously. So this, uh, this type of program, you may have them for two or three hours, and in that class, one semester, if it's in high school, you may be teaching them science and math, and then the other semester, you might be teaching them social studies and English, or some, some version of that. Um, why was this invented? It was invented because people cannot, you cannot keep someone in a essentially a newcomer class for two or three years and they don't earn any credits especially in high school because the clock is running they can't stay in high school until they're 30 years old and earn the credits they get to i think they're 21 or so so the idea is that you will and this is i think the best situation is a sheltered instruction class where you deal with both teaching english and teaching the content um students serve those obviously you can't serve a, you can't have a sheltered class with a student who speaks zero english and has zero knowledge and that's a newcomer and those students may need a couple of months just to get them up to speed also you have to look at their own academic background those that have studied and have significant education and don't have interrupted education like you know missing fourth and fifth grade or something because they weren't in school at all if if you have students that have uh, some basic they're, that they're ready to do a geography class or social studies or english then you have a sheltered class you may have to make a lot of adjustments because you're going to still going to have a broad area of students in there in terms of abilities and language skills. But that's why we call it the SIOP approach. And I can tell you more about that SIOP. You can actually do a, you can Google that, or I can, if somebody wants to know about it, I, I teach a class on it 826 in the spring. But that is a, is an approach where you design both content objectives and language objectives together and you teach a sheltered class so that students know they have to do certain things. They have to write paragraphs or they have to give a speech or they have to discuss. That's language objectives. And then they have content objectives. They have to talk about the origins of the Civil War or they have to talk about the expansion of, of, of the West and the conflict with Native Americans and say Nebraska, if it's Nebraska history, etc. So you teach, um, this is uh, ideal. I consider the shelter program because it meets academic credit and academic progress and it meets languages. Uh, it, it teaches English as you go. Probably the best option. Uh, then you go to, now the other one that is also very prominent here is the newcomer program, which is fairly high intensity. And I put the word LEP in here. It's something still used, but not used by me. Language uh, limited English proficiency students. We don't use the term limited English proficiency anymore, but you'll see it occasionally in the legal uh, paperwork and laws the government still uses. And what is it in this particular class? Well, for newcomer, that means you have to get them up to up to some basic conversational and listening comprehension ability so that they're able to participate in school. For elementary kids, it's easier to blend them in. It doesn't mean that a fifth, uh, a five-year-old that has never spoken English can walk into first grade or kindergarten and be immediately able to participate in it. It does mean that they're able to catch up faster than if they were an eighth grader, okay? Children, and if they're in the right situation with a lot of social interaction, 
with, uh, especially if it's, a cl if it's a group of kids where they're bombarded with English all the time, immersion can sometimes be useful, it'll work. But that is like, uh, I always compare it, it's like learning to swim by being thrown into the pond and seeing if you survive. You don't do that, to, you, you really don't want to do it to anybody, but if you don't do it to older students because their capacity to pick up the language in the shock and in the difficulty is stressful. So newcomer programs uh, are needed at any level, but, but they require a lot of effort, especially if you have a newcomer high school. That's where the expertise of the SL teacher and the flexibility of the administration and designing a schedule to where the newcomer can have a fair amount of exposure to English outside the classroom or in other classrooms, but still gets quite a bit of specialized attention, particularly for newcomers, cultural things have to be taught. Uh, younger kids, you may have to teach them how to use the, uh, the bathroom facilities. Um, somebody comes in, they've never had, uh, never used toilet paper to where you put it down the toilet. There, there've been, and I've known situations with the kids, that was something totally unfamiliar to them. It depends on where they come from. Not everybody is close or watches television and knows basically how European and Americans and other groups work. You may get a student from an area they've been in a camp you can't assume that. You, you can't assume things about taking care of having pencils and you have to really study the culture to understand what is it about that this student will not understand or is alien to them, it's totally new to them in the school system, okay? Uh, you can't assume anything. That's why I'd, I just can't sit here and list everything. Could be the way people eat, following the rules, um, um, keep their hands to themselves, sitting in their chair when class is going on, any of those things that you assume uh, most students would figure out or it would seem logical, they may not follow that. They, they won't follow the pattern of the other kids in the room. They may be totally, totally different for them. Okay, so my recommendation is that if you can, as an ESL teacher, the sheltered instruction is probably, especially for older students, is the best option, okay? Better than the ones on the first page, the pull out and, or the push in, or, you know, having just an ESL class. The sheltered instruction, sometimes you can have students that are not ESL in there. For instance, if it's a, uh, a basic math class, you may it would actually benefit to have a mixture of kids. You don't have to have all non-English speakers in there. Um, your administration and you have to decide if, which kids will fit best in which situation. Um, again, this column over here on ESL certification, I would always argue should be endorsed in English second language. Um, now, as far as, you know, it says over here how long these programs last, sheltered instruction, a lot of times people should be in them for a couple of years, and then after that, they should, if they're still young enough and they're still in high school, for instance, or middle school, then they should join regular classes, but that'll be determined by passing the ELPA, that would be the Nebraska ESL class, uh, or yes, English Second Language Examination. Now you can see that uh, sheltered instruction, you're still in ESL. So you're in the program and you would still need to take the ELPA to get out of that. And then if you get out of that, then you'd go to the regular science class instead of a sheltered class. The newcomer is one to two years. I know I talked to some people at Lex. I know kids are in there for maybe a semester or, or longer. Uh, you can correct me on that, but I mean, it, it just depends on the school. Newcomer programs can be as short as a month or two weeks, and as long as a semester, I suppose. It depends on the situation and the group you're working with. Okay, so those are the two I would recommend uh, as fairly stable and pleasant 
for the ESL teacher to work with. You have control. You don't have people tossed in from the outside and you have your own room. I think teachers love to have their own room. Now, the last page is strictly unusual programs for the most part. Now, I do have the dual language program, Lexington, and I believe some other schools have the dual language program. And so I'm, you know, I'm very, very supportive of those. I love dual language because you have speakers of two, at least two different language backgrounds and they learn both languages. The only problem with the bilingual or dual lingual is that it's almost always Spanish and English. Although there is a dual language program in Denver, uh, I believe a charter school, and they actually have three languages. They have English and Spanish, and on one part of the school, they have Chinese and English. So you actually have kids or kindergartners uh, learn Chinese along with their regular schedule, their English, regular English. Uh, on the other side, they learn Spanish with English. And you can have Spanish speakers come in, and theoretically, you could have Chinese speakers come in. In a city like Denver, you would have Chinese students. They would learn their own language and English. It's a very, I'm very positive about these kinds of programs. Uh, there's a one-way dual, I'm kind of jumping down to the bottom. And for these, they, they have listed bilingual certification. We don't have that in Nebraska. So um, we just hire people that teach one way or the other, one of the two languages. Um, there's a little difference in those. I don't really go on about the, these dual language because it's not really part of an ESL program. That's something special, and you may have three programs in the state of Nebraska like that. Okay, uh, transitional bilingual uh, and developmental bilingual, late exit. Um, I think transitional bilingual is, is more uh, helping kids in their first language to establish their reading skills in their native language, which almost always is going to be Spanish. And then they're able to learn to read in Spanish, and then they're able to learn to read in English. And that's temporary. Early exit means they're there temporarily, and then they move on. Um, and then uh, developmental late, um, they have bilingual, and they deal with uh, kids that are a little bit older. And they, they, one of the ideals about learning English second language is thought that it's good to read in your own language first before you learn to read in English. That is certainly true, but most schools don't have the capacity to teach even in Spanish and teach reading in Spanish because that's teaching in Spanish. It's not just Spanish as a foreign language, it is teaching in it as if you were in Spain or something or Colombia or whatever. So these programs on this page, both dark brown and light brown, these are very unusual, so I don't really hold these up, and I don't claim any expertise in them. Um, so that, that's all I have to say about that. But I wanted to make this presentation to you so that, that you'd be familiar with them, and you, can, you will have a copy of this with you. So you can see where I pointed to it and talked about it, and I wanted to do this the other day on the rules and the laws and stuff, but I forgot where to hit my little button thing to share. And now I learned last night, and I'm thinking of going back. But this is almost 20 minutes long, or 30 minutes long, so I'm going to shut up now. This is given to you to give you some background information of types of programs. Got to be, to be an advocate, you should know what you're advocating for, particularly in terms of teaching methods and teaching programs. So this is one of a number of things I'm shipping out to you. So I want to thank you, and I hope this has been a helpful presentation, and I hope it looks okay when I stop it. So I'm going to put it up for you tonight. Thank you.